evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Caroline Noakes, one of the female members of the Works of Art Committee and Member of Parliament for Bromsey and Southampton North. I would like to take the opportunity this evening on behalf of the Works of Art Committee to welcome you all to the Atlee Suite for this inaugural International Women's Day Lecture. Before I hand over to Jane, Dame Joan Ruddock, who will formally introduce the lecture, and to Professor Krista Kalman, I would like your, to draw your attention to this beautiful portrait of Margot Asquith, which is the subject of this evening's lecture. The committee were very fortunate to have been able to acquire this portrait by Philip de Laszlo recently, and this evening is the first time that it has been displayed since the important conservation work. It's certainly very exciting, and I have to say, as a member of the committee, it's a real thrill to see it for the first time in all its glory. The Works of Art Committee think that it is very important that the parliamentary art collection reflects the role women have had in Parliament. The first woman to be elected to Parliament was in 1918, with the first woman taking her seat in 1919. So I believe it is imperative that figures such as Margot Asquith are included in our collection for their significant influences on Parliament and the world of politics. It is, of course, interesting. I firmly believe that the, the art collection has a, a dearth of women in it, and we need to do more and do better, but it's important to remember that we are rather playing catch-up. In more recent years, the committee has been very pleased to add some stunning contemporary portraits of women MPs to the collection. The most recent being the portrait commission of the Right Honourable Margaret Beckett MP by Anthony Williams, for which he was awarded the 2012 Ondaatje Award for the most distinguished portrait of the year. I would invite all of you, as you leave this evening, to have a look at the portrait which hangs just outside this room. Uh, it's certainly absolutely fantastic. I can remember coming in this room to the unveiling of the portrait and I think I can honestly say that the committee were absolutely thrilled with the quality of the portrait and the award that it received last year was richly deserved. It is now my great pleasure to hand over to Dame Joan Monarch MP. Joan entered Parliament as the member for Lewisham and Deptford in 1987. It's marvellous, isn't it? It's sort of one of the theatres of this place. We get, we're very good at standing up and sitting down again. Uh, and Joan has had a very distinguished career, including the, being the first ever Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Women, a position to which she was appointed in 1997. We are delighted that she's uh, agreed to introduce this evening's lecture. Joan. Thank you very much, Caroline, and may I actually add my uh, welcome to that of hers, because it is a pleasure to see all of you here today. I've been asked to make a short contribution of my own before I actually introduce the speaker. And in this week of International Women's Day, I think we frequently celebrate the achievements of women who are not parliamentarians, and rightly so. Indeed, those of us who are here would not be here without them. But tonight, I want to share with you a few thoughts on the state of female representation in this misnamed Mother of Parliaments. When I arrived in 1987, we were 41 women amongst 609 men. I describe this place as a cross between a boys' public school and a working men's club, with the worst attributes of both. I don't know how I managed to marry one of the inmates. <laughs> it has improved, but only because of the courage and persistence of women, both those elected and those influencing selections in the constituencies. Even so, there is no equality of representation here, and often no equal treatment. Frankly, this institution is a disgrace. Caroline may agree or disagree. I see she agrees. She is, after all, part of the new Conservative Women's Intake, which took their numbers from 17 in 2005 to 47 today. And absolutely excellent women they are. But beware of the myth that this women business is sorted. Today's Conservative women are very visible, with the consequence that there appear to be many more women than there actually are. And still fresh in the memory is also the dramatic doubling of women MPs between 1992 and 97 due to the Labour Party's use of all women shortlists. Less well known and remembered is the fact that the following election, the numbers fell when the party abandoned this positive action. This led to my presenting a 10 minute rule bill to put positive action on women 
in parliamentary selections into statute, a measure which was adopted by the Labour government a year later. But despite all our best efforts and different forms of positive action by the parties, women make up just 22% of today's parliament. Over the past 15 years, the average rate of increase has been around 1.3%. I don't know if you're capable of doing these maths, but I'll give you the answer. That means 100 years to parity, 100 more years before we have an equal number of women and men. Yet already, male MPs are complaining that there are talented young men out there who are still not getting a chance. And I recently announced that I would stand down in 2015. So naturally, we had a discussion about whether the constituency wanted an all-women shortlist. One woman, a good friend of mine, wondered aloud whether, after having had a woman MP for 25 years, they should give a man a chance. I had to respond that before me, the constituency had elected continuously for over a hundred years, only men. Let me give you a few more figures to remember. In the 95 years since women were allowed to stand for parliament, only 367 of us have been elected. And that includes the 146 sitting today. Even more shocking, only 35 women have ever sat in a British cabinet. So let me conclude by quoting Professor Joni Lewandowski, who said, the representation of women in political decision making is vital, not because it will necessarily make a difference for women, though it often does, but because justice demands it. We cannot wait another hundred years to achieve parity between women and men in this parliament. We need to understand our immediate history and change accordingly. But we can also learn from the past and honour the women who came before us. Which brings me to tonight's lecturer. I'm delighted to introduce Krista Kalman, Professor of History at Lincoln University. She is a founding member of the Women's History Network and serves on the editorial board of Women's History Review. She will also be known to many of you for her part in the campaign to save the Women's Library. Her latest book, Women in British Politics, looks at the relationship between women and Parliament from the court of Queen Mary in the 16th century to the election of Margaret Thatcher. And she demonstrates that women were active political agents long before the campaign for votes. She also looks at the times in history which were not heroic moments of change and progress for women, but which were nonetheless crucial in the progress towards women's political citizenship. The topic of her talk this evening, Margot Asquith, highlights what her book demonstrates, that women sought to influence Parliament even when they were not able to vote or to become women MPs. Krista. Thank you for that generous introduction, and thank you very much for the invitation to be here this evening. Um, when I was asked to speak about Margot Asquith, I did pause because I've always found her quite an enigmatic figure. I do have to say that having done the research for the paper, I find her an equally enigmatic figure. But hopefully what I can do tonight is at least give you a little bit of an introduction to this fascinating woman and the world in which she was moving. The Margot Asquith, Nee Tennant, Countess of Oxford, political hostess and diarist, as her entry in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography describes her, has not been a central figure in 19th or early 20th century women's history, is in itself indicative of the complexity of her character. On paper, she would appear to be an ideal topic for an academic history biography of the type where the focus on the individual's life is used as a cipher for the context of their broader social and cultural times. Women's history in Britain has come a long way from its early days when the subjects of its research were much more likely 
to come from working class or socialist cycles. And there are now several serious studies contextualizing the lives of middle class and indeed aristocratic women. Neither did Margot ask that Lever would be biographer <coughs> or short of source material. She left a copious archive, including a diary that she kept from childhood that branched into two separate political and familial diaries between 1904 and 1914, numerous files of correspondence, a two-volume autobiography, and other shorter autobiographical fragments. She lived during an era of popular newspaper and magazine journalism and the rise of film, and featured prominently in both of these media. Her life was exciting and glamorous. Described as a celebrity by at least one magazine, she was at the centre of late Victorian and Edwardian society with a capital S. Every inch the fantasy act of woman, she smoked and swore around self-consciously and copiously, danced with the Prince of Wales, sat on Tennyson's knee and had a poem written to her by him, prayed with General Booth in a railway carriage, was close to several prime ministers and married to one. She gave birth to five children, of whom two survived, and was stepmother to five, to five more. She lived through two world wars, and she was closely involved with both the arts and the fashion industry. Yet, as a biographical or a historical subject, she still remains marginal. I would suggest that part of the reason for this lay in her party political affiliations, such as they were. Although the political focus of women's history has extended over the past four decades, the history of women in the Liberal Party has yet to draw anything like the level of scholarly attention that has been given to those attached to conservative or socialist parties. Despite the fact that the Liberal Party's female group, auxiliary group, the Women's Liberal Federation, had become the largest of all three party groups by 1912, there is still no single study of the history of this organisation. Leading Liberal women have seldom, seldom rarely been the subject of historical inquiry, either singularly or collectively. And then added to this, of course, there is Margot Asquith's own <coughs> political positioning, which makes it rather difficult to fit her into the mould of a pre-suffrage political hostess or a grand dame. <coughs> Margot was never an activist in the Women's Liberal Federation, nor even a figurehead for it as the way, in the way that Catherine Gladstone had been. Although her stepdaughter, Violet, was one amongst a number of women related to pre-war male politicians who were invited to stand for Parliament in the 1920s, Margot never sought to build an independent political career. Nor was she linked with the women's movement. Indeed, when Lady Constance Lytton was imprisoned for suffragette activities, Margot wrote an acerbic letter to her friend Frances Balfour, Lytton's sister-in-law, demanding to know, is Connie off her head? In my talk tonight, what I want to focus on is Margot Asquith's self-presentation as a particular sort of political figure, one who does not slide easily into any of our available analytical frameworks. As Asquith left a formidable archive, there is need for some selection. I have focused here on her published autobiographical writings rather than on her diaries, as these offer a more obvious way into her selective self-presentation. In some ways, Margot's autobiography adheres to the tendency identified by Susan Bell and Mar Marilyn Yalom, who take their women who take their gender as a given in their writing rather than reflect upon it. Her relationship with her autobiographical self is also complicated, revealed by her tendency to adopt a playwright style of direct dialogue when recounting certain key conversations, Margot dialogue, Asquith dialogue, and it sort of goes down the page like a play. Many aspects of her life are omitted from the two volumes which she published to great critical and financial success between 1920 and 1922, including her appearance in the notorious Billy Libel trial of 1918, which called into question her close relationship with the dancer Mary Allen. Nevertheless, the autobiography remains an important source, not only for what it reveals about the social and political world of Britain in the critical decades before the First World War, but also because it represents Margot Asquith's own take on her life and the way in which she chose to represent it. In questioning how we might assess her as a political figure, I will begin by saying something briefly about the role of the political hostess and how it had developed by the end of the 19th century, a role which many women were using as a route into politics or political power. I will then briefly sketch other late 19th century political roles available to women before considering Asquith's presentation of her own personality in more detail. When fitting a life as rich as this into 45 minutes, there is of course a need for selectivity. So my focus is on the point in her life immediately before Asquith's premiership, when she's establishing herself as a social and political figure about town. 
In particular, I want to look at two of her identities, that of the new woman and that of the celebrity. The work of historian such as Elaine Charles has been instructive in recovering the very public contribution to politics made by a slightly, a slightly earlier generation of aristocratic women who played an active role in the electioneering of the late 18th and early 19th century. Historian Paul Langford has described how politics in this earlier era was not restricted to parliament or organized institutions, but extended into a variety of cultural and social milieu, so that party allegiance determined attendance at race or hunt meetings or at social venues such as the assembly rooms. As the location of politics broadened, women found ample scope to participate. Their most obvious and, I think, controversial role came during contested elections. This move could attract criticism when it was felt that their behaviour overstepped the bounds of propriety. Georgiana, the Duchess of Devonshire, one of the most famous examples, found herself at the centre of scandal in the late 18th century when it was thought that she moved too frequently and freely amongst lower class voters in active support of the Whig campaign. We hear the D-S of D grants favours to those who promise their votes to Mr Fox was how the Morning Post reported on what became known as the Kisses for Votes scandal. Um, this is a contemporary cartoon showing the same thing. She was accused of kissing, not just kissing people, but kissing butchers, which seemed to be it was. <laughs> These scandals were not the norm, however, and many women did help at elections, wearing political colours and distributing literature throughout the century. The young Margot Asquith herself made use of the colours in support of at least one of her father's election campaigns, as we shall see. Outside of election times, women had other political roles. The most obvious was that of the grand political hostess. Martin Pugh claims that certain qualifications were essential to this role, including beauty, intelligence, houses close to Westminster and in the country, and of course, an appropriate husband, so it's quite a limited constituency. <laughs> in a period when invitations to dinner parties, or a longer Saturday to Monday, as it was then correctly called, were under women's control, the political hostess arguably wielded a significant degree of power because she decided who was invited to these gatherings rather than her husband. Kim Reynolds has pointed out, however, that the role was tightly connected with party, meaning that there was really only one hostess at a time, as the idea was that you would be able, as a great political hostess, to bring the party together to discourage faction fighting within it. So you really didn't want two or three Whig hostesses or two or three Tory hostesses because that would cause divided camps. Nevertheless, as the 19th century unfolded, the central position of women such as Lady Waldegrave, Lady Palmerston, Lady Holland and Lady Molesworth, who were the most frequently cited, was beginning to be underpinned by numerous other political wives whose husbands' careers may well have also owned much to their distinctive entertaining skills. Reynolds claimed that the role of the political hostess was decreasing by the end of the 19th century, although the point at which she finally vanished is a matter of some disagreement. Lady Jeanne decided, insisted after the death of Frances Waldegrave in 1895 that she was the last of the political hostesses because, said Lady Jeanne, after her death, the political culture had altered to such an extent that the aristocratic political hostess was essentially redundant. Politics was becoming a much more socially mixed business. Margaret herself felt that it was her great friend, the Duchess of Manchester, Lady Devonshire, who was the last great political lady in London society. But the periodical press was loath to let this role go and was keen to hold on to some semblance of the hostess role, role of the world and helped to fuel a, a public fascination with the lives of political wives, as we shall see. Political wives obviously were more numerous than hostesses, but equally in demand through their potential to act as patrons and friends to aspiring politicians. Thus, by the end of the 19th century, when Margot comes to town, as it were, while the focus on individual hostesses may have decreased, women's potential to exercise political influence in the social arena had certainly not. At the same time, changes in organisational structures for political parties were offering, offering women new opportunities for participation. Local government and municipal politics provided new roles, and new role models such as Emily Pankhurst and Millicent Garrett Fawcett, municipal feminists who were beginning to eschew influence in favour of more direct political involvement, and who were also middle class rather than aristocratic, which is another important shift. And we have some examples here, the Women's Liberal Federation on the bottom left and indeed on the bottom right. The top is a very poor photograph of the Primrose League because although history books are full of wonderful Primrose League photographs, I actually couldn't find any that would scan and put on screen properly. 
Although only the Independent Labour Party permitted female membership, other parties inaugurated affiliate organisations such as these which welcome women. So the Conservative Party had the Primrose League and this offered some of the more flamboyant and better known instances of female electioneering. Often these were personal rather than directly political. The most famous one involved Jenny Churchill touring the Woodstock constituency with her friend Lady Georgina Curzon astride the latter's tandem and begging voters, please vote for my husband because I'll be so upset if he doesn't get in. <laughs> it worked, he was returned with a rather large majority. The wives and daughters of leading liberal politicians took a less personal approach but were equally involved. Catherine Gladstone took on the presidency of the Women's Liberal Federation at the grand old age of 75, and although her position was mainly as a figurehead, she nevertheless served as a very important symbol of the political family. Between elections, both the Women's Liberal Federation and the Primrose League, and the women's groups affiliated to the Mixed Sex Independent Labour Party, were providing a space for women to develop their own political practices. So by the end of the 19th century, the middle class woman had a number of political roles available to her. She could influence directly through social settings and connections, or participate herself in official auxiliary organisations. Young Margot Tennant did not fit comfortably into either of these roles. She did not host political soirees or at homes, or tramp the streets in search of votes. The epithets that were most frequently attached to her before her marriage were those of the new woman or the celebrity. Yet in writing of herself, she frequently used the word political. Politics had a central part in her life through her family, her marriage, and her numerous strong friendships, some of which spread across party lines. In the remainder of this talk, I want to explore these identities in more detail and consider how they may have shaped a different sort of political role for Margot at a point when women's political identities and spaces were beginning to shift. As this is largely concerned with Margot as a public figure, as I said, my exploration of her character rests entirely on her own self-presentation supplemented by popular contemporary portrayals in the Victorian and Edwardian periodical press. After her presentation, this is Margot Asquith's new woman, after her presentation at court in 1881, Margot Tennant became a frequent figure in society gossip columns where she was always portrayed as a new woman. Although there has been much discussion as to whether the new woman actually existed outside of the columns of the popular press, there was, by the 1880s, a clear consensus of what a new woman should look like and how she would think. As an article in the student magazine of Owens College, Manchester, put it in 1888, the new woman smokes. She rides a bicycle, not in skirts. She demands a vote. She belongs to a club. She would like a latchkey if she has not already got one. She holds drawing room meetings and crowds to public halls to discuss her place in the world. Regina Gagne's study of 19th century autobiography has noted that the writing of middle class women frequently contains examples of their opposition to convention. Margot's autobiography certainly adheres to this pattern in spades, I would say. It suggests that much of her claim to the identity of new woman lay in her deliberate unconventionality rather than the more obvious trappings of popular caricatures. There are no lengthy descriptions of cycle rides in her book. As a keen horsewoman, riding, not bicycling, was what she knew and cared about most, the last bit's her own words. Riding takes up quite a lot of space in the text, and she presents herself as being both bold and accomplished in the saddle. As a child, she rode her pony up the steps to the family home, a trick she endeavoured to repeat in the tenant's London home in Grosvenor Square, when she took her large bay hack, he was 16 and a half hands, tattersalls, up the front two steps and into the hall where he, quote, caught his reflection in the mirror and instantly stood erect upon his hind legs before crashing to the floor topped by his rider and a crystal chandelier. In her many depictions of hunting, she shows herself as reckless with no fear of speed. On her first hunt, she assured the Duke of Beaufort that she meant to ride like the devil and did so despite being thrown. As a rider, she had no fear at all in defying gender conventions. She was proud of the fact that she got onto her horse without assistance, to the surprise of observers, one of whom explained that Margot Asquith was the very first woman I saw ever mount herself without two men and a boy hanging onto the horse's head. <laughs> she rode fast, and she had absolutely no fear of difficult horses who, who had names like Storm and Havoc that belied their temperaments. 
Both volumes of her autobiography contain hair-raising descriptions of her numerous falls and injuries, as well as her many successes in the field, and contemporary pen portraits cite her as an excellent horsewoman who rode very straight after the hounds. Yet, she did not display, unfortunately I couldn't find a picture of her anywhere, there is tons and tons of print in magazines like the Sportswoman and Field and Horse and Hound describing her as a rider. I couldn't find a single photograph of her of astride a horse. Yet, she did not display total disregard for contemporary gender expectations of women riders. In accordance with convention, her autobiography shows very clearly that she rode with a lady's saddle, seated side saddle, as in the picture, rather than astride her mount, as some women were beginning to do at the time, like on the bicycles in the bottom. Margot's attitudes towards dress when not in the saddle are best described as fashionable rather than unconventional, so again, very unlike the new woman. Dress interested her very much, and she described her many outfits in great detail. For riding, she wore the standard riding habit, not a divided skirt. For dining at Glen, her family home, she had two best dresses, which gave her, quote, my first impressions of civilized life. So clothes and identity are very closely bound up in her writing all the way through. Only once does she note her appearance for having caused a sensation for the wrong reasons. And I've got some pictures here of her in various fashionable outfits throughout her life, I think, that give some idea of her interest in clothes. When she once went to a supper party hosted by Lord and Lady Randolph Churchill, wearing a white muslin dress with transparent chemise sleeves, a fichu, and a long skirt with a natier blue taffia sash, adorned with a bunch of rose carnations pinned with three diamond ducks. So you get these very lengthy descriptions of, of the outfits. What she should have worn to the occasion was a ball gown and tiara, because the Prince of Wales was the guest of honour. In quoting some of the remarks she overheard, do look at Miss Tennant, she is in her nightgown. I suppose it's meant to be the oldie English picturey. Margot was at pains to exonerate herself from this faux pas, explaining that she was invited at short notice, had no time to change, was not informed of the dress code, and then apologised loudly to the Prince of Wales, who of course, being a gentleman, assured her that he admired her frock very much. <laughs> Margot's interest in fashion continued in later life. She invited the designer Paul Poiret to give a show in the official residence during her husband's premiership, <coughs> an event which led to dismissive press references to number 10 Gowling Street, as well as criticism of her lack of uh, consideration for British seamstresses. Coco Chanel was amongst the 14 invited contributors to her edited volume Myself When Young that she published in the 1930s. But nothing Margot or others have to say on this subject suggests that she had the slightest interest in dress reform or in intending to wear the type of outfit attributed to the new woman. Bloomers, uncorseted costume, and other avant-garde appearances were not part of her self-image. So why then does she get this epithet, the new woman? It can be deduced in snippets of her autobiography, which I would argue are potentially much more shocking than riding astride or unconventional dress may have been to her, her readers at the time. She makes several allusions to her habit of smoking without any acknowledgement that this may have been controversial for a woman in the 1880s or the 1890s, or of her habit of entertaining mixed company in her bedroom, although on this she is a little bit more defensive, suggesting that she realizes that it may not be acceptable behavior either to her fantasy of her contemporaries or to her later readership. She explains then how in the Peebleshire family seat, the Glen, she and her sister Laura frequently received both men and women friends who wanted to sit up in their bedroom, which was converted out of the night nursery into a sitting room. The shutters were removed and bookshelves put up in their place. Amidst walls covered in caricatures and crucifixes, prints, prints of prize fights and fox hunts, a Morris carpet and chintzy wallpaper, Margot and Laura would, quote, sit up in bed with coloured cushions behind our backs while the brothers and friends sat on the floor or in comfortable chairs around the room. We would read by the light of a single candle, tell ghost stories, or discuss current affairs, politics, people, and books. Margot claimed that she and Laura were disturbed and upset on hearing that they were described as being fast as a result of this, and she continued the midnight meetings in defiance of convention. She was similarly defiant in her autobiography when she relates how, having taken tea in the bedroom of Peter Flower, the dashing young brother of Lord Battersea, with whom she had a long-standing and very passionate love affair, Margot was called to account by Mrs. Bow, a neighbour of Flower, whom, with whom he had allegedly been previously involved. When Mrs. Bow suggested to her, going to tea with a man who is in bed is a thing no one can do, Margot furiously defended herself. 
Her discussion of the incident, though, in, um, interestingly, then deflects any question of whether or not she was right or wrong by describing in great detail in her, um, in her sort of play script text an ensuing quarrel with Flower, rather than interrogating her own behaviour or connecting it to early censures of her tendency to flout flower convention. If personal political engagement was one means of defining the new woman, then Margaret might be said to be lacking. Her autobiography offers some discussion of activities that might be considered as political. I'll come back to this later, the second part, the left-hand side of this later. But it's not one, it's not a discussion that's particularly detailed or involved. In one chapter, completely out of context almost, she describes undertaking some voluntary work in the East End of London amongst girls like the ones in the photograph the picture there who worked in a cardboard box factory. She took them for annual treats to the country, attempted to lure them away from their alcoholic public house lunches by speaking to them on undisclosed subjects whilst they ate their sandwiches. Her inspiration for this work was her sister Laura, who died in childbirth tragically young the year before. And Margaret mentions that she started a crash of whopping with Laura the year before, but there's no other discussion of this. The East End work is short-lived, however, as she returned to the family seat in Scotland at the end of the season, and then didn't return to it, although she does make a point of saying that she derived as much interest and more benefit from visiting the poor than the rich. Other than that, she drops the, the subject of this direct involvement. Initially, politics in the autobiography are presented as a familiar affair much more to do with her love of flouting convention than an interest in policy or economics. Her father, Charles, a wealthy industrialist, was Liberal MP, first for Glasgow, then for Peebles and Selkirk, where Margot described how his defeat of the city of Tory led to, quote, high jinx, I pinned the Liberal colours to the coattails of several unsuspecting Tory landlords as they walked around the town. Her father's position brought many leading Liberals to Glen, and Margot describes her relations and friendships with them in great detail, but although she claims at one point that her stepdaughter Violet and her own daughter Elizabeth were, quote, the only girls except myself who I ever met who were real politicians and not interested merely in the personal side, the sections of her autobiographical writing dealing with politicians says much more about their characters than their politics, and offers little by way of comment on their policies or ideologies. A parade of prime ministers, Gladstone, Salisbury, Rosebery, and Balfour, feature prominently in her writing, along with Asquith himself, but it is their personalities that dominate her character sketches. Of Balfour, she wrote, what interested me most and what I liked best was not his charm or his wits or his politics, but his writing and his religion. Salisbury did not care fanatically about culture or literature for Plato, Homer, Virgil, or any of the great classics. What does stand out in her writing is her lack of criticism of any views that she might be thought, have thought to have been opposed to. Despite her earlier discourse on the benefits of political philanthropy, both to the recipient and to the bestower, she offered no comment at all on her observation that Balfour had, quote, no interest in low wages, drink, disease, sweating, and overcrowding, because, overcrowding, because he saw nothing that needed changing, which in the 1890s, I think, is going it. Margaret's lack of partisanship in her presentation of political opponents, I would argue, stemmed from her involvement in the souls, a small aristocratic group, David Canadine defines them as a clique, prevalent in the 1880s and 1890s. It is arguably through the souls, two of whom are represented in um, Sargent's portrait of the Wyndham sisters there on the top left, it is arguably through the souls that she developed a particular sense of how politics might operate in her own life. The souls coalesced around four aristocratic families, the Balfers, the Wyndhams, the Littletons, and the Tennants, and were around 40 members in number. They originally referred to themselves as the gang, but were renamed by Charles Berryford, who remarked that as they did little other than sit around and talk about each other's souls, I shall call you the souls. <laughs> Nancy Allenberg's very detailed analysis of the group's membership describes them as being monotonously well-born. Although Jane Ridley's more recent account for the new dictionary for the Dictionary of National Biography notes that by aristocratic standards, many members of the souls were actually relatively poor, something which limited their ability to entertain on, a, on the scale of competing social cliques, such as that led by the Prince of Wales. Balfour, not a, distin not a disinterested observer, of course, he was at the very heart of the group himself, once suggested that no history of the fin de siècle period would be complete unless the influence of the souls upon society was interrogated and included. Rather than hosting elaborate balls and parties, the souls' social events revolved around the intellect, 
literary and philosophical discussion, and intellectually stimulating parlor games. They were great enthusiasts for the latter game, a precursor of Scrabble that sparked a craze in country houses in country house parties at the end of the century, although the souls ostentatiously played it in German and French rather than in English. <laughs> they also enjoyed psychological wordplay, penning character sketches of each other against the clock, inventing book titles to summarize each other's character, with the group then guessing at the identity, or declaring in one word the thing which had given them most pleasure in life, Margot said hunting. The souls numbered men and women amongst their members, something which did not go unremarked on at the time. Although compared to similar social groupings, they, drew, they attracted little by way of sexual scandal. As Alan Berger noted, although they were, entirely, they were not entirely lacking in flirtations, natural children, and market liaisons, they were not, unlike competing social sets, overtly promiscuous, and much of their activity was underpinned by a deliberate assertion that men and women could share an interest in aesthetic, literary, and intellectual questions. Although not an artistic society per se, they championed certain writers and artists and cultivated a self-consciously bohemian image typified by Margot and Laura's boudoir of Morris, Morris Prince and Chinches, combining, as one commentator has put it, the characteristics of the Holland House set with the Bloomsbury group. Predictably, their status as a clique also attracted negative comment, and Margot did admit that they were looked upon as somewhat pretentious. The political dimension of the souls was subtle as far as party politics was concerned. Sexual politics were not overtly discussed either, but they were not without political significance in their gatherings. Well, whereas leading political hostesses of a slightly earlier generation had distinguished themselves through their ability to unite leading figures across party lines, this, this mixing had become much more difficult by the end of the 19th century. But the souls continued to do this, refuse, refusing to take a position on the political basis of social acceptability. A key feature of the group, according to Margot, lay in its ability to draw people together across party, rather than sacrifice friendship to public politics. Several leading politicians became members of the souls from both, from both parties. Arthur Balfour, George Curzon, George Wyndham, Alfred Littleton, with Asquith on the fringe, of course, through his marriage to Margot. Balfour himself claimed that prior to the arrival of the souls in London, Tories and liberals of distinction never met. As they were not a society with formalized membership, the point of their dissolution is difficult to establish, although most commentators concur that they had effectively ceased by the start of the 20th century. Nevertheless, their influence, it might be argued, continued through numerous high-profile political appointments. By the 1910s, several cabinet ministers from both political parties sorry, in both political parties, were former souls. I now want to look briefly at Margot as a celebrity, the other half of her public persona, and how that might sit with her politics. As I said, her autobiographical <coughs> writing presents her as an accomplished social figure at the heart of the souls, although not central to the heights of fantasy economic society with its aristocratic hierarchies. Her passion for riding, that I've alluded to, is actually often used as a cover in the novel for more complex social failures. In her first London season, she confesses, I didn't receive many invitations to balls, but immediately covers this up by saying, but well, that was fine because what I really enjoyed doing was riding in the row. And it was through her knowledge of horses that she first came to become friends with the Prince of Wales, after which, she said, she was invited everywhere. <laughs> Other observers placed rather different emphasis on her engagement with society. <coughs> Mary Elko, who's in the middle of the portrait there, one of the souls, and a sympathetic reporter, recalled how Laura and Margot caused a tremendous commotion on their arrival in town. They were quite unlike anything that London had ever seen before. They were astonishing. The Tennant sisters were wealthy, but comparatively so, with an industrial family fortune dating only from the late 18th century. Through the marriage of their elder sister, Charty, to Lord Ribblesdale in 1877, the sisters got, a far, got further social opportunities, but this success gave rise to some resentments, with contemporary pen portraits suggesting them as social climbers. Laura escaped the world's censures through her deep religiosity and her ultimately, ultimately her early death in childhood. But Margot, who by her own admission of being outspoken attracted criticism, was a frequent figure in the fin de siècle periodical press, where she received both positive and negative attention. The most infamous portrayal was fictitious. In 1893, E.F. Benson, son of a former Archbishop of Canterbury, published Dodo, A Detail of the Day, a satirical novel whose central character, Dodo, was widely assumed to have been based on Margot. 
Margot denied the association, but did agree that the description of Dodo's sitting room matched that of her own perfectly. And there was enough in it to convince contemporaries, such as the Prince of Wales, who allegedly very publicly greeted her as Dodo at a party. Benson himself officially denied the connection and wrote to Margot to apologize, to which she famously responded, oh, Mr. Benson, have you written the book? How clever of you. But the link persisted, and it is quite clear. Dodo smokes and swears in equal measure, dabbles in charity work in the East End, is a member of a fearsome social set called the Apostles, of whom her fiancé Jack is somewhat afraid. Furthermore, she is a fearless rider with a vicious black mare who she rides down the road at a swinging gallop, tearing at the rein and tossing its head. The caricature was potentially damaging. When the engagement between Margot and Asquith was announced, Lord Rosebury took Asquith aside and advised him, if he hadn't done so already, read Dodo, there's a great deal of truth in it. <laughs> Whilst a mock confession album, along the lines of those that, uh, that featured in the Soul's Parlour Games, and purporting to come from, a, from the couple that was published in a magazine just after the engagement, showed Asquith claiming that Dodo was his favourite character in fiction. Even the sympathetic portrayal of Margot that featured in a character sketch of her husband in the Review of Reviews the year after their marriage admitted, not all the disclaimers in the world can blind us to the fact that, uh, that in drawing his impossible and distasteful heroine, Mr. Benson had as a kind of artist's model the lady who is now Mrs. Asquith. The social and political status of the bride, respectively, ensured that the announcement that Margot Tennant was to marry H.H. H. Asquith, then the Home Secretary, attracted a great deal of press attention. It was not the first time that an engagement to Miss Tennant had been featured in the press. Indeed, she had been falsely linked in potential matrimony with other leading figures, including Balfour and Rosebery. But this time, the stories were accurate and drew no retraction. Reaction to the engagement was mixed. <coughs> Margot admitted that Rosebery and Randolph Churchill without impugning me in any way, deplored the marriage, fearing that such a union might ruin the life of a promising young politician. As a society figure, she was not considered to be sufficiently serious. Gossip columnists jostled to damn the bride with faint praise, many of them using the opportunity to revisit the Dodo connection. The anonymous speaker, writing in Judy magazine, ascribed her frequent press appearances more befitting to an actress or a neurotic lady novelist to a wicked young man of a, Archiepiscopal, well, Archbishop's descent, sorry, I can't pronounce it, extraction, who wrote a dreadful book which the gossip said was all about her, before declaring that in fact he knew nothing of these matters. So, sort of standard journalism trick, you revisit the whole thing and then say, but of course I really don't know about that, so I can't comment having actually outlined the whole story. The article then predictably praised her skill as a rider before concluding with the hope that they'll be very happy in their married life. In another piece in the Liberal Review, noted that widespread interest in the marriage, the things that were singled out most, were his sudden leap into the front rank in the political world and her position as the best known, per the best known person in the cultivated society of which she is a member. The wedding itself attracted similar levels of coverage. According to The Guardian, it was one of the most brilliant events of its kind ever seen in this generation. Everybody who was anybody was there. The approaches to the church were filled with a compact mass of carriages, whilst all around dense crowds of sightseers collected in the hope of seeing some nobilities who had promised to attend. Margot described how her sister's old nurse was offered £10 for her ticket. An item on the wedding published in Picture Politics included a facsimile of the marriage certificate with the comment that its witness, witness signatories, Gladstone, Rosebery, Arby Haldine, Balfour, and of course Asquith himself, included past and future prime ministers. It was a comment by the Bishop of Rochester in his nuptial sermon that gave one of the possible means of presenting Margot Asquith as a political <laughs> asset despite her conventional celeb sorry, her controversial celebrity status. Acknowledging the attention that the wedding had drawn, Bishop Rochester expressed the opinion that at no previous period in English history had the English people cared so much as they do now about the home life of their public men. The marriage took place at a point where the earlier figure of the political hostess was losing her position to a newer breed of political wives. Often, these were women inspired by new social movements such as socialism and feminism, who were simultaneously seeking political careers of their own, such as Margaret MacDonald or Catherine Bruce Glazier. Although independent to a degree, 
They were frequently positioned, though, still as helpers and supporters of their husband, sharing the political potential of social engagements rather than seeking to act as power brokers as an earlier generation had done. Although the political wife was an important figure in her own right, by the late 19th century, the celebrity status that attached to Margaret Tennant had made it difficult for contemporary commentators to now position her as a political figure with any degree of certainty. Many of the periodicals aimed at a largely female readership in the late 19th century covered politics from a feminine angle. In an age when women had no parliamentary vote, the coverage in the popular press did not extend to questions of policy, which remained the providence of specialist political magazines such as the Women's, Liberation, Women's Liberal Federation of Youths. Political coverage of female readers concentrated on the dress, homes, and activities of women attached to prominent politicians. Margaret Tennant was not easily assimilated into this group. In 1895, a year after her marriage to Asquith, an article describing the wives of eminent politicians by Alexandra McIntosh in The Women at Home named her as the political wife whose career was currently exciting the most interest amongst observers. In a lengthy feature that described how women were taking the more active and independent part in politics and singled out the work of the Countess of Jersey and Lady Randolph Churchill for the Primrose League, the political aspects of Margaret's character were less clear. He singled out her wit, vivacity, and beauty, her freedom from conventionality, and her membership of the souls, but was unable to offer any commentary on her political work in a more general sense, as she still had no connection or attachment to causes or groups such as the Women's Liberal Federation, despite her continued self-identification as political. But in the physical space of the home, should be, yeah, Margot became easier to position. There was increasing emphasis on the importance of the political wife by contemporary commentators who were now keen to acknowledge the part which great ladies connected with the government play behind the scenes. Alongside pen portraits of the political wife, independently or in a group, the periodical press now began to carry detailed descriptions of the layout and decor of their homes, emphasizing women's taste and skill in arranging such locations. The Pall Mall Gazette carried a series of articles by Edge Kettle offering, the, offering insights into, into the domestic arrangements of the Herbert Gladstones, the Harcourts, and the Asquiths. Whilst the interest of each piece for the contemporary readership obviously was intended to derive from the political prominence of the man of the household, it is the influence and taste of the three wives that forms the centre of the descriptions. The piece on Mr. and Mrs. Asquith at home, which appeared in July 1906, depicts them not in the Chancellor of the Exchequer's official residence of 11 Downing Street, but in the more lavish townhouse in 20 Cavendish Square that Margot insisted that they continued in, in, occupy, in occupying because she said it was a more suitable family home. Asquith himself features in the piece, but it has much more to say about Mrs. Asquith as befitting such a domestically oriented <coughs> article. There were some references, again, to her sporting achievements, both as a horsewoman, the second volume of her autobiography notes that her, her doctor advised her to resume riding later in life as a means of curing insomnia, and also as a golfer, a sport that she'd taken up just after marriage. The article is lavishly illustrated with photographs of the couple and of their rooms. Interestingly, no photographs of them together. There's a photograph of Asquith on his own, there's a photograph of Margot on her own, and then a photograph of Margot and this is her own daughter, Elizabeth. It's not one of the adopted children. It praises her taste in developing, quote, an exceedingly pretty and dainty apartment. And again, the political potential of the domestic space is emphasized throughout. Readers learn that Asper's desk, full of a mass of official looking documents, also holds portraits of his wife. In the dining room, <coughs> which is in the picture there, which is lined with Florentine velvet and Persian carpets, the centerpiece is the mahogany table, where many political friendships have been laid and cemented. The article clo closes by noting that this bright, joyous English home, enlivened by children and graced by a woman who practices well and wisely the art of homekeeping, was an eminently suitable home for the man who was a <coughs> custodian of our national purse. In reality, other sources suggest that the Asquith family budget was far from secure. Margaret was a lavish spender, but not least on dress and on horses, and depended on her father for a significant allowance even after her marriage. This idyllic um, magazine portrayal offered her a role that was unthreatening and in step with the domestication of politics at the time. Although she later confessed to disliking 10 Downing Street, finding it, quote, an inconvenient house with three poor staircases, ill-suited to entertaining. 
Mixing domesticity with political representation offered her a means of protecting her image against more negative press portrayals. Her skill as an entertainer, a reputation that she had cultivated prior to her marriage and secured after it, <coughs> came to the fore during Astrid's premiership. It is worth noting that prior to her arrival in 10 Downing Street, there was actually very little for her to draw on by way of an immediate recent role model. Catherine Gladstone had notoriously taken little or no interest in this side of her role, leaving much of the entertaining up to her eldest daughter, Mary. Rosebery, Salisbury, and Campbell Bannerman all had wives who were extremely ill, and indeed many of whom died during their premierships, and Arthur Balfour never married. In this context, therefore, it's not surprising that the historian Pat Jolland described Margot as the exception amongst Prime Minister wives from the late Victorian and Edwardian period, who delighted in throwing brilliant dinner parties but nevertheless, her extravagance drew criticism from political enemies, but also from friends who felt, not unreasonably, that the couple were rather on the edge and living beyond their means. So, to throw out some points by way of conclusion. In the second volume of her autobiography, after Asquith became Prime Minister, Margaret's writings on politics became even less introspective than they initially were. She offers much detail on events as they unfold, but almost nothing by way of comment. On questions such as the suffrage, she is virtually silent in her book. A strong and outspoken new woman such as Margot Tennant might have appeared to be a natural suffragette, but her personal discourse suggests the opposite. The closest she comes to commenting on women's direct involvement in politics in her autobiography is in a remark made in connection with her stepdaughter Violet, who was becoming an active liberal in the 1920s where Margot wrote, life in the house is neither healthy, useful, nor appropriate for a woman, and the functions of a mother and a member are not compatible. This was one of the reasons why my husband and I were against giving the franchise to women. Whether this was really her belief, or whether she wrote this out of loyalty to her husband is difficult to discern. In private, she had suffered, certainly, from the suffragettes' persecution of her family, including attacks on their home and threats to kidnap their children. Yet, when she edited the later volume of Myself When Young, some years after Asquith's death, she included Sylvia Pankhurst, Edith Picton Turberville, and Ellen Wilkinson amongst her contributors. So she had these very complex and contradictory facets that run throughout her self presentation and make it very complicated for a historian to offer an assessment of her, make it as complicated for a historian to offer an assessment of her politics as it was for her contemporaries to locate her securely amongst the genre of political wife and hostess. One obvious conclusion would be that she ought not to be counted as a political figure other than through her marriage to a rising star of the Liberal Party who was to become Prime Minister. But this is completely at odds with her own interpretation of her life, as, as, as I've said, she makes continued references to herself both as political and as liberal. This emphasis did not diminish in her later forays into autobiography. Indeed, her own contribution to myself when young states plainly that in all my life, all my interests have been political. A political identity was clearly important to her and remains so both after her husband's withdrawal from politics and from his death. How then can we summarize her politics from her own autobiographical self-fashioning? Although she self-identifies as a liberal, Party is less important to Margot Asquith than political friendship <coughs> and a shared outlook. In many ways, her politics were located firmly in the personal rather than in the public arena. Her chapter on the souls emphasizes and underlines this, stressing friendship above political allegiance and taking pride in the group's ability to cement very long-lasting friendships across party lines. The connection, this connection between personal and public politics raises the question of whether she might rightly be considered as a proto-feminist. But her lack of identification with the women's movement belies this, and to label her in this way would, in, uh, would I would say, be anachronistic. She remains a complex and contradictory figure, at the heart of the political establishment, but much more interested in its personalities and its friendship than directly in its policies. Taken to her seat, I 
feel somewhat prematurely, <laughs> uh, because shortly we shall uh, invite him to take any questions that there may be from the audience. It falls to me to thank both uh, Krista for a phenomenal lecture and Joan for her earlier introduction, which I have to say both provided food for some considerable thought. Uh, I always describe this place as not a cross between a boys public school and a working men's club, although I have to say to Joan that is a phenomenally accurate description, but uh, rather as a boys prep school, so I don't even let them get beyond the age of 13, uh, and Hogwarts. Um, so perhaps, perhaps we have learned a little this evening of the, uh, the, the views that female MPs might have had of this place in the 21st century, but it was certainly fascinating to contrast Joan, I feel somewhat negative uh, portrayal, but it's going to take us a hundred years to get to parity, with the depiction that we had from Krista of the role of women uh, more than a hundred years ago, when of course we had a, a significantly further way to come. Although there were, and indeed are, some significant parallels and some things which really struck a chord with me, the, the depiction of the political hostess as <coughs> an adjunct to her husband, but somebody with whom the media had a almost fatal fascination with their dress, their lifestyle, the way they manage their homes, uh, certainly, I have to say, a fascination that seems to prevail to this day, whereas a female MP, you are far more likely to gain column inches for your shoes than for anything that you have said. I'm always very cautious to wear the world's most tedious and boring plain ones. Uh, but equally, uh, the comment that Parliament is I think uh, I'll probably misquote Crystal on this, but it was not regarded as a healthy place for a woman and certainly not compatible with motherhood. I mean, that really does provoke, I think, in, in the female politicians in this place some, uh, some serious soul searching at times, but also, I have to say, a level of anger as we are determined to prove that it can be compatible with motherhood and certainly need not be uh, unhealthy at all. I really would like to give my sincere thanks to Chris for giving up so much of her time and I think educating us all enormously about the role of Margot Asquith as a political wife and hostess. But I would now like to invite her to come back up here and if any of you have any questions, we have a couple of roving uh, microphones which Emma and Melanie are going to operate, one on each side. Uh, and Chris, would you come back? And I'm sure that the audience will have a number of uh, searching questions for you. No, I don't like to kick off. There's a lady there who's looking almost willing, which uh, it's always important to have the first one. <laughs> oh, is it, are you holding it from Eris? <laughs> Um, no, this isn't a question so much as I just want to make a couple of points. Um, I don't know if you fully conveyed her wit and rudeness. I mean, she was notorious for her wit really bordering on extreme rudeness. And I mean, this may be apocryphal, but one of the stories you might have heard is, is her meeting Jean Harlow. <laughs> yes. It's just so great. And explained to Jean Harlow how to spell her name. And she said, the T in Margot is silent, as in hollow. But the other point I want to make was about the media, because she <coughs> actually became very unpopular in the media, and particularly in the First World War, where she was held up as being a kind of germophile. And there were all these rumours that circulated that she that she was given, visiting during the prisoner of war, actually you know, involved in passing secrets. And it was true that she wouldn't um, get rid of her, her nanny, her daughter, Elizabeth's old nanny, who was German. She didn't want to part with her because she'd saved her daughter's life, apparently. And you know, all her friends said, you've got to, you've got to send her packing, etc. And she, she absolutely resisted that. So there, there were a lot, the Harmsworth press, particularly, really attacked her. And she was more unpopular than than Asquith to herself. I think that's my time. Yes, I, I did you want to respond so, to that? No, I, I will do. I mean, fine. Um, I think the 
you're, you're quite right, Lucy, and I was, in a sense, I was sort of disappointed to not be able to, to weave more of the, the wish in. The first of all, stuff again, you're quite right about. The thing about her presentation in the press is, of course, it shifts, and I would say it kind of goes through three stages. There's the stage where she is either the Society for Beauty and Success or the actual slightly controversial new woman, which happens at the same time, which is the position that she's at at the time of her marriage, which she sort of struggles with. Then there's the sort of slightly later, sort of 1890s to about 1906, 1907, where there's a much more domesticated political wife image coming out. And then in the war, she becomes, as you, as you say, incredibly unpopular again. When I sat down to start to do this, because there is literally so much material about her, it's how you bring it together. I thought, well, in 45 minutes, I'll focus on the first bit of the life up to the point at which Astrid becomes prime minister, just to put some sort of sense on it, really. But I do think it's really interesting that in the autobiography, she's almost silent about the first world war stuff in the controversy. Now, I think we have a small conflict here. I think uh, Jamie's going to take over to the questions from me. I have to go over okay. to That's the wonders of standing down. <laughs> Spoken and witty and so forth, she she towed the party line that she wouldn't go off message, that actually she took very seriously her position as our squid's wife. But she does go off message on certain things, big style. She has she has things to say on the Irish question that get kind of really hot on the show because they're not really in, in the project. I think it's quite interesting being a being an incredibly confident feminist historian, of course, what I did having written this talk was I showed it to two men who were also historians. One of whom is a historian of the Liberal Party, and one of whom is um, just more, more a historian of, of middle class culture and sort of um, hegemonic ideas and class formation. I got very interesting responses. The historian of the Liberal Party said, yes, great, fine, really captured her. The historian of, of class formation said, well, actually, what she's doing is fitting in with this sort of um, this broader liberal identity, which is actually not a conflict, not in conflict with conservative identity, and that's why she can have these cross-party friendships. Because of course, it's very interesting. She goes on and on about her ability to have friendships across parties and how parties are much more, much less important to her than ideas and intellect. She doesn't have any socialist friends. <laughs> Or not, you know, not that she admits to, <laughs> despite hanging out with the cardboard box girls in the East End of London. So I think actually there's a, um, I think one, of the, I think one of the reasons why she doesn't go on so much about her politics is because for her they're taken as a given. Because although she might disagree with Balfour a little bit on some party points in general, they're kind of in it together. They're not looking to change society ra ra radically. They're looking for the same sort of neoliberal consensus, if you like. There's a man over there who would like to ask a question. <laughs> it's all right, I don't, I don't need a microphone, I'm sure. Um, I thoroughly enjoy... <laughs> they all say. <laughs> <laughs> I will use the microphone if that's helpful. Um, I thoroughly enjoy your lecture, thank you very much. And I, I learned a lot about something I, I knew nothing about before. Um, looking at the portrait that has been displayed, um, perhaps an unfair question of a historian, but I, I did history at uh, the university and did history of art as a, a sub-course, so perhaps you might feel you can venture out on a comment on, in the light of what you've said about your heroine, how do you think that's been reflected in the rather wonderful picture that's been in front of us for this evening? It's, I, was, I, I looked at the portrait I looked at the portrait before I start, started to write the talk, and what I feel is, is 
I'm not an artist or anything, I'm completely out of it. What I feel is that that does not portray to me the woman that I read about in the autobiography. It, it's I think she's far not... more austere, far more severe. Yeah. Than... I, 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 that, that's exactly what I sort of got yet to say. I know nothing yeah. about her, but from listening to you and looking at that picture. And that's what I was trying to convey what's, in, the, in the earlier slides, where you've got her in costume. And, yeah. Yeah. So, all of the contemporary um, the descriptions of that they all so occasionally she's referred to as beautiful, but generally people say actually she's not beautiful, but she had an amazing presence. She's very, very striking. And she says herself in her autobiography that she wasn't the most beautiful of the sisters and she was less beautiful after she'd broken her nose a couple of times and split her lip from riding and riding her. <laughs> but she's quite upfront about this, but she has a beautiful figure. She's very proud of her figure. She's very, very proud of the fact that after having given birth to five children, she's still the same dress size as she was when she was eight, when she came out. So, you know, she's very proud of her figure, loves clothes, doesn't have pretension to being a beauty, but does have this, this presence. Which I, I would suggest you don't get in that picture. But she's a serious figure in that picture, though. You wouldn't argue with her. No, no, I agree. You wouldn't argue. She looks, though, like a woman who doesn't have any fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's how she looks. Yeah. You she doesn't look like a woman who wrote her all the That's right. She portrayed her as a woman who did have fun and was very lively. But again, it might be for a political reason that she sat and was portrayed in this way. Yes. Um, I'm and then the, the rest of it, the fashion and everything, she's clearly interested in this, but the way she presents it, it's there on the side, but the real fun is to be having the great outdoors. I think she's quite unusual in that, because you know, most of our sports personalities aren't, don't do fashion, most of our fashion personalities don't do sports. Mm -hmm. Well, somebody might tomorrow be it. Maybe, one day. maybe. Yes. Just going on from that, how proactive was she in developing her brand? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Um, well, I think that is that's perfect yeah. self-management, isn't it? I mean, you you could spend hours deconstructing that, by, um, not least by the fact that. She, of all the children, and okay, many of the stepchildren have left home by this stage, but some of the stepchildren are still there. But it's her natural child who she has in the portrait, and this is a, it's a very intimate but very domestic portrait. And obviously, she would have decided what rooms can be photographed and things, and, and the way in which they're arranged. I think she becomes quite proactive, and then, of course, as an autobiographer, desperately so, because there's not just the two volumes of autobiography. There's also these little autobiographical snippets, the autobiographical sketches, and even actually the archive. The archive is fascinating because the diaries are not written at the time. That well, they are, but she says and herself, well, I wrote my diaries, but sometimes I was too busy to write them, so I took notes, 
and then I wrote my diaries from notes, and there's all sorts of things stuck in the diaries, like pictures and locks of children's hair and things. So actually, the, all diaries are a form of, of creation, but the diaries are a slightly more selective form. So I think, I think very proactive, actually, in creating her brand. Yes. Thank you. Just picking up on that, um, were the um, Osmai Rufi's um, published? Were they quite popular? They were extremely popular, yes. They were massively widely reviewed. Um, the most famous comment from, generally very favourably reviewed actually, the, but the, the most the comment everybody remembers is not a favourable one. It's the review by Dorothy Parker, who said the most enduring love affair in English, in English history is that of Margot Asquith and Margot Asquith. <laughs> This might be more of a question for Melanie, really, but can you tell us something about, or can somebody tell us something about the portrait, who commissioned it, how it came about to be here? Um, actually, I think I'm going to pass that to Emma sometime earlier. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, yes, the portrait um, came up for auction um, at Asilo Christie's. Um, it had been in the family, I think, until about the 1920s. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a family portrait, um, which we luckily acquired through. Through auction. Sorry, the artist? Oh, the artist Philip Delazo. What year was it painted? Uh, now you're testing me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've got your question. It is 1920s. And it was sold, interestingly, just before the outbreak of the Second World War. Um, which seems not time to sell off because the art market was very depressed at that moment. It was also sold without its frame. When we bought it, it had no, um, it didn't have its contemporary frame with it. So it's actually been reframed um, in a Delasso frame. Um, it's interesting, she sold it. She sold it herself. And one, um, certainly financially, she wasn't in the best of She was in very living, poor and, yes. So I think she probably sold it to raise money. Mm -hmm. Any idea who bought it? No. <laughs> no. Crime videos. Um, no more details. Sadly. No secret lover there. <laughs> well, there might have been. Well, there might have been. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> still secret. So, a hand over there, yes. Um, did she publish her own biography because of the financial constraints like the Countess of War? <laughs> There's a, a great suspicion that she did. Yes, they were run. They obviously they were out of office at that time. The fortunes of the political party were declining. They were kind of almost homeless for a while. They sort of ha um, camped out with the Cunards and various other people before they acquired a house that was somewhat smaller than the one they had previously. And they need, they needed money, so she turned to writing. As a, and she wrote. She did some journalism as well. But um, the autobiography was a, a real hit. Okay, I think, I think that's it. Well, thank you very much, Christopher, again, for answering all those questions and going to comments. And thank you, I think, to very much the audience for having put them and having joined in this uh, very considerable evening of delight. Thank you very much indeed.